on centre court. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down eight points at 75.19. The pound buys a dollar 27 and one euro 16. LBC weather: showers will linger for some time this evening, but turning drier for most. Plenty of clear spells throughout the night, with the odd shower reaching lows of six degrees in Scotland. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Lottie Morley. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's four minutes past seven on LBC. Welcome to the programme. We're streaming this hour live on Global Player if you'd like to watch us. It's our monthly phone-in with Labour Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves, who um, defected to Tom Swarbrick last month, <laughs> I mean, purely because I wasn't here. But I'm, I'm back sure. here now, back, Ian. Back where you belong Back where now. I belong. Exactly. Happy in this seat. Um, I'm very pleased to see you back as well, Well, thank Ian. you very much. Now, it's been quite a tumultuous couple of months since we last spoke. Um, the cost of living crisis seems to be getting worse and worse. You've been talking a lot about mortgages. I'm sure we're going to get lots of calls on mortgages over the course of the next 45 minutes. The number to call if you'd like to talk to Rachel, ask her a question on any aspect of what Labour would do in power or criticism of the Conservatives, 0345 6060973. You can text 84850. And of course, you can say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. I think we'll go straight to the questions so we can get as many in as possible. Great stuff. So Debbie is in Stoke on Trent. Uh, obviously, lots of marginal seats there. Debbie, what would you like to ask Rachel? There are, yeah. Hello. Hi, Rachel. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask what you would propose doing um, to stop the supermarkets making such huge profits while there's such a serious cost of living crisis going on. And I, I feel that they're making it ever more complicated for people to price check. Well, thanks very much, um, Debbie. And it's great to talk to you today. I think you're right to be concerned about what's happening. I mean, whether it is the weekly food shop, the energy bills, mortgages and mortgages and rents, everything seems to be going up at the moment. And there was a report published, I think it was yesterday, by the Competition and Markets Authority looking at the supermarkets. Now, they particularly picked on what they are doing in terms of fuel prices. And I think we you know, all know, we probably didn't need a report to, to know that when they can get away with paying, charging more, uh, they do. And prices seem to go up very quickly, but down very slowly. So I think there does need to be more work done on looking at whether there is proper competition in the market, whether uh, supermarkets are, are using their power to keep prices uh, high for, uh, for for too long. But, you know, there is a wider issue here with the cost of living. If you look at inflation in the UK, it's 8.7%. It's only 4% in America and it's 6% in Europe. There are things going on well, in that, the UK economy. To be economy. fair, there are lots of countries in Europe where it's either at our rate, Austria, Sweden, for example, or, or higher. The average, you're right, is lower than here. Yeah, I mean, 6% compared to 8.7%. Yeah. So it's quite a, a big difference. And there's a number of reasons for that, um, particularly on energy, for example. You know, this government got rid of the gas storage, and so we're paying over the odds for our gas. They banned onshore wind, which is the cheapest form of electricity, and they stopped the programme of insulating people's homes to keep them warm in winter and all those things are adding to the costs of ordinary families but also the costs of businesses as well and that's one of the reasons why we've got such high inflation here we need to take some of those longer term measures to better secure our economy particularly on energy but also for example by building more housing because there's been huge pressure on mortgages and rents well that's the next question but just to stick on debbie's question for a moment what do you think is an excessive profit in percentage terms for a supermarket? Look, I think it's different for, for different products in different uh, markets. So I'm not going to just to pluck a number out of well, thin air. Well, the supermarkets will think, tell you they yeah. make 3 or 4% profit on what they sell o overall. Now, I, I mean, I don't know, Debbie, whether you think that's an excessive profit, but I, I don't think for most businesses that would be seen as an no, excessive No, and it's profit. not just the supermarkets. Look, there's also lots of complaints about some of the um, big producers of, of goods that are, um, you know, using this opportunity to whack up the prices that they're charging the supermarkets. That's why I think it is right that, you know, there is work done by the regulator. You know, the Competition Markets so Authority is there work. for a, a reason. Well, look, I think more work is needed on this, particularly around supermarkets 
supermarkets. We've only got a few big supermarkets in the uh, UK. And uh, one of the things that I always notice and always feel that, you know, you see these advertised prices and then you go into the shops and those things are not always available. And they're not always available in the smaller shops. And so I think there is a thing about making sure that the, the cheapest item is always on display and always available for customers. Um, Debbie, that was kind of what raised my question because what I find it, I mean, not everybody's got the luxury of walking around with a calculator or even having the time to do this. What I'm finding more and more is that whereas previously you used to look at the big value packs, so and sounds, you know, well, let's go toilet roll, um, packs of 24 toilet roll, bumper value pack versus a small pack of nine. You, they're advertised as such, they've got a great big palette. So people are drawn to buy that pack at eight, nine pounds, whatever it is. Actually, if you work it out, you're paying 33% more per roll buying the big value pack than you are buying packs of nine. And I just think that's, that's to me, it's almost fraudulent. It's like it, it should be displayed. They should have to display prices either per each or by weight per kilo. And they're getting cleverer and cleverer. Some items are per each, some are per kilo, some are per pack. Unless you've got all the time in the world to go and actually work it all out, it's impossible to know what's, what's the cheapest. And we can save quite a lot of money by actually working that out. Yeah, but as you say, Debbie, you know, a lot of people are, are really stretched for time. You're not and, gonna do it. Yeah, and they hope that if they go into the supermarket, the prices that they see on the TV adverts that are actually going to be available in the, in the shops. And I think that is one yeah, of the things that, that needs to happen. This, this isn't that, though, Rachel. Yeah. This is being deceived by... You, you automatically go to big bump, bump... What they call super value packs. Well, yeah, you, you assume they're cheaper, don't pack. you? It should be... It should actually be called the more expensive pack. Debbie, I think yeah, you should have a programme on LBC to give people advice on what they do. Ian, you know, watch, do, do watch know, this space, the, the, Ian. The number of people that think that they should have a programme yeah. on LBC. You'll be after this one This is good soon. advice. This is good advice. I, I, I'm after the job of Chancellor, uh, Ian. But maybe maybe she, one day. She said hastily. Um, Debbie, thank you very much. That's actually, if you buy sort of like supermarket goods through Amazon, they do do that. They tell you if you're buying, I don't know, shaving, not, not, not that you would buy shaving gel, not not, not yet, anyway. Um, they, they, they tell you what, what it is per milliliter, so you can compare all the different products. Yes, but, but the important thing is when you're shopping online that they put the cheaper products at the top because often what people do is just they just yeah. press click on the first one and they assume that's the sort of the own brand one or the, the value one but sometimes those things are hidden you know so it's whether you're going to the supermarket or shopping online I think there does need to be much more transparency as Debbie says. All right, Debbie thank you very much for that let's go to uh, Manny who's in Chalton in Greater Manchester really important question Manny what would you like to ask Rachel? Oh, Hi Rachel. Oh, Hi yeah, Manny. Manny. Bit of interference uh, yeah. in the background uh, yeah. there. So uh, yeah, so I am 24 years of age. We've completely been let down by this government. Unfortunately, I was one of the people that voted him into power. Um, that will not be happening. I have full faith in yourself and Keir Starmer. What can you do for me? And what are you? What, what hope are you going to give me today that I can actually get on that housing ladder that I really wanted to get on? So tell me about your situation, Manny. Are you renting privately? You're still at home with parents? Living, on, living at home with parents. I've got a family. I've uh, got two kids, um, and I want to now move out and get my house and added. But this government has, since since this trust crashed the economy, it just feels like everything's just got harder now to do. So, you know, more people are getting pulled back. It's just, it's just, we're in such a bad position yeah. where we're just not moving forward. And I, honestly, it's, I'm one of those people at the moment that are just always tweeting, you know, general election, oh, we need a general election, get these people out of power. Yeah. Well, you know, Manny, I, I, it's no consolation to you, but there's so many people in your situation. The number of people who are living at home with you know, parents has gone up by 700,000 in the last 10 years. Um, and that's often in cities where the available availability of you know, uh, property that is affordable, either for rent or purchase, is just yeah. disappearing. And that's why we've made house building a big part of you know, our offer, as we call it, going into yeah. the election. Now, you'll know, Manny, because you're going to be following these things closely because you're trying to get onto the housing ladder, that the government have got rid of the house building targets, yeah. which means yeah. that the house building is not happening. I think it's at its lowest level now for 70 or 80 years. 
And then we've also got on top of that, as you said, the sort of Tory mortgage bombshell yeah. that uh, you compared to... 13 minutes it's taken you for that one. Oh, yes. Ian, Ian Dale <laughs> told me earlier I was only allowed to say Tory mortgage bombshell at once on the programme. <laughs> and I think I've already said it twice now, Ian. No, I've um, twice, okay. But um, no, it's, 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 a really, it's a really important uh, point because people who are coming off fixed rate deals this year are paying, on average, £240 more a month than the deals that they're coming off. And for first-time buyers, I was was chatting to one of my colleagues who's an MP in the West Midlands, and he was telling me about a constituent of his who was living in London but couldn't afford to buy there. She's in her 40s or 50s and is a mental health nurse, moved back to the West Midlands where she was from, was, you know, put an offer in on a house, but by the time that the offer was accepted and was going to go through, she could no longer afford it. I, that's yeah, probably what's happened to you as well, Manny, because of the increases in interest rates. So we've said that there should be a mandatory um, 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 pr- pr- um, programme that people with mortgages should be able to access support, not a voluntary programme like the government has introduced. And we need to build housing so that young people like you, and especially people with families, can have a home of their own. Because for too many, that dream of home ownership is just slipping further out of reach. And I think if you work hard and you're bringing up a family, you should be able to have a home of your own. It's not too much to ask. And I hope, Manny, that we can help you in government to fulfil your dream for you and your family. Manny, thank you very much for that. Just just on mortgages, though... um, um, what is the difference between your package to help people and the one that Jeremy Hunt announced last Friday? Yeah, so there's two key things that are different. The first of all is that theirs is a voluntary scheme, so it's up to the lender whether they want to participate or not. And about a million people who um, have mortgages will miss out because the government scheme doesn't cover theirs. So but, we think it but should most be... have said they are going to support this, haven't they? Yes, most but the... of the lenders. Yeah, fine, but a million people who um, potentially need help are being excluded so that's why it should be mandatory the second difference between our scheme and the government scheme is that our scheme also covers buy to let mortgages why because because what we're seeing at the moment is that people in the private rented sector are paying higher rents because their landlord's mortgage has gone up. So I think it is right that if you are a landlord, you should be able to extend the term of that uh, mortgage, uh, for example, like homeowners have. Otherwise, what you're going to see is landlords selling up, taking their houses off the market. and Which and, they're and, actually already doing. Yeah, which is, a, yeah, which is why this scheme needs to cover um, buy-to-let landlords as well, because this is about ensuring that those people who can't afford to buy for the reasons that Manny has set out are not seeing themselves evicted that, or seeing their monthly rent going up. And there was numbers, I think it was from the BBC last week or the week before, that showed that um, rents had gone up by average of more than 10% across the country in the last year. And, and that's because of what is happening in the mortgage market. So those are the two differences. It should be mandatory so everyone's covered and it needs to cover buy to let. Otherwise, it's people in the private rented sector that are going to be paying the price. That's quite something, though, to reposition Labour as the landlord's friend. No, it's m- a renter's most... friend. It, it, this is about helping people who are privately renting because at the moment, their rents are going up and up. People are being evicted to make way for people who will pay it and landlords are just taking taking their properties off the market because it doesn't make financial sense to them anymore. And this is disaster for people who are trying to uh, to rent and trying to keep a roof over their head. So that is why it's important. Now, we've also said that we would introduce a, a private renter's charter to help people in the private sector secure more rights than they've got today. So an end to no-fault for example. But no rent controls, because you, seem to have, you as a party seem to have changed your position on that. Lisa Nandy, who used to be in favour of rent controls, uh, has said that they would send the wrong signal now? Well, I don't think under Keir's leadership, rent controls have ever been um, our policy. So I don't think there's a U-turn there. Um, If you take Scotland, for example, they've got rent controls, and yet Edinburgh and Glasgow are two cities in the UK that have had some of the highest increases in rent. So these things don't always work. Our private renters' charter is about increasing rights for people in the rented sector, an end to no-fault evictions, four-month notice periods, um, not allowing this um, situation at the moment 
where people are saying no children, no pets, for example. So many people are now in the private rented sector who previously were able to buy their own home, but because of the Tory mortgage bombshell are no longer able to. We need to make sure that we've got a private rented sector that actually works for people who are renting. Just on mortgages, though, um, I lived through the mortgage crisis of the late 80s, early 90s, when my first mortgage... Um, I was paying fourteen percent interest rates, mm-hmm. and I don't. I may be misremembering this, but I don't remember there being a clamour saying the government must step in and do something to help. Do you not worry though that if you become chancellor, we've we've now developed into a society where whenever there is a problem in the economy, people now expect the government to come to their rescue. Now in COVID. I mean, I was totally in favour of that happening. But I do wonder whether we ought to possibly be a little bit more self-reliant and and take responsibility ourselves for the risks that we take when we take out a mortgage. Yeah, but I I don't think anyone could have envisaged what happened with the Conservatives' mini-budget last year, which sent mortgage rates through the roof and what's happened since then. And the big problem is one of the big differences between now and the early 90s but remember in the early 90s loads of people had their homes repossessed mm. and we fell into recession which, so which, we don't want to go through that there isn't actually a again. lot of evidence of that happening at the moment is there but it, it, once these all these fixed rates come to an end i suppose that's when the tsunami Look, could happen. so could this is the problem come. i mean already the number of repossessions has gone up by 50 percent now it's from a low base but if we carry on like this we are mm. staring into um, an abyss so we do need a policy response which is why we set out the uh, more um, uh, offer that that we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think the other difference, though, between now and the early 90s, and I remember, you know, my mum had a a mortgage then, and like you, you know, her mortgage went through the roof and she didn't have much money to spare. She was a primary school teacher. Mm. Uh, You know, she was on her own and it was tough. But back then, houses were much more affordable than they are today. Now, I think the average house price is something like 11 times the average income. That is very different to the early 90s, where, of course, houses in Britain have always been expensive, uh, but that gap between what people earn and the cost of a house has gone through the roof, which is one of the reasons why we need to build more housing to enable more people to realise that dream of home ownership. We'll move on to some more subjects in just a minute. Uh, We've got a full switch board of calls, but you can text 84850 and send your comments via Alexa. Send a comment to LBC is all you need to say, followed by your question. It's 20 past seven. This is LBC. This is LBC with Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. 22 minutes past seven on LBC. All right, let's go to... We've got Rachel Reeves with us in her monthly ring Rachel slot. We've got Raj in Ivor who wants to have a word. Hello, Raj. Hi, Ian. 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 Hi,
Hello, good evening, Ian. Good evening, Hi. Rachel. Hi, Ross. Uh, thank you so much for taking my question. So I'll get straight to it. Um, I completely sympathise with the plight of Manny on the call who was phoning earlier and many tenants by the way. Uh, my position is I am um, a buy-to-let um, uh, landlord. Um, I have a small portfolio. I do not want to raise my rent. Absolutely. I, I sympathise with the plight of many people and many may roll their eyes and say, oh come on, that's hardly believable. But it is. Now one thing I'd like to ask Rachel, 2015 George Osborne dropped a bombshell section 24 and for the layman out there it removed uh, the obligation to deduct um, interest and other financial costs uh, before taxing on profit. Um, would you do anything to repeal Section 24, make it easier for landlords, and in effect, make it more affordable for tenants? Um, well, thanks very much for calling, uh, Raj. I've been very clear as Shadow Chancellor that I won't make any spending commitment uh, without explaining where the money is going to come from, and that includes tax cuts and spending commitments. And so if I was going to say, oh, yes, we'll just get rid of Section 24, mm -hmm. people would rightly say, well, how are you going to fund that? Because debt as a share of our economy is already 100%. So you need to say where the money is going to come from. And there's lots and lots of calls on public finances at the moment, whether it's more money for the NHS or schools or actually tax cuts for ordinary working well, people. Let, so let's, this let's is look, not something... Let's that, look at it from another way. Do you think it's intrinsically unfair that landlords are taxed on turnover, whereas ev everyone is everyone else is taxed on profit? I mean, on, on the face of it, it seems to be inequitable. No, I, I don't think it is um, unfair. Um, I, I think that, um, and also I, I believe strongly that there are a lot of demands on public finances at the moment, and this cannot take a priority amongst all of those um, other things. But I have, says Raj, as you know, and as in my answer to Manny's question earlier, that we believe that the the, the rights that the government have negotiated with some of the lenders to extend mortgage terms, for example, or go on to interest only, should also apply to buy-to-let landlords so that the mortgage increases yeah. are not passed on to, uh, to the tenants. So um, I hope that the government accepts that, but that would be something that we would do if we were in government today. Yeah. And Rachel, do you mind if I get one more quick cheeky question? I in, don't please? mind. Oh, you're very kind. So you mentioned earlier that you know that there is currently a shortage of house building at the moment. Something that would really boost many sectors, including house building, would be potentially repealing um, the reforms to IR35. Now, um, just again, for others out there, it's a change to off payroll tax. Um, what we've seen now since um, Hunt, uh, Jeremy Hunt reversed that decision, was you've seen blanket determinations. And as a result, it has really strangled a workforce out there, which includes those in construction. So I would just say, rather than commit you to an answer, please do consider it, because I think at the moment it's looking highly likely like you and Labour are going to get in. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to okay. get that out there. My what key priority... Th thanks, Raj. Um, I will just answer that. My key priority to get the builders building would be to bring back the housing targets for local authorities and also to uh, reform some of the planning rules. That means it takes so long uh, to actually get anything through the planning system, uh, as well as making it easier for local authorities to build on land. Those are some of the practical things that we would do to get the houses built that we desperately need in our country. Um, Amit in Leeds has got a similar question. It says, can you ask Rachel her stance on IR35? Will Labour review this legislation for the self-employed? I mean, every time you come on, I think we have covered this before, yeah. the, the, the text board is fill, filled up with people who are concerned about this. Now, again, you're not going to say, well, I'll do that, because, well, it'll, but it'll, it'll only cost £3 billion or whatever. I, I know you're not going to commit to that, but would you commit to reviewing it? Look, I, I do understand the concerns that people uh, have, that they've seen their tax bills go through the roof. I'm, I'm also very mindful of people who uh, suddenly find they've, they've got a backdated tax bill that they find very, very difficult to pay, and I think that um, HMRC uh, needs to Lo loan charge can, scheme, yeah, yeah on the loan charge scheme need to you know be considerate of people's individual so circumstances just, so just on that would would you commit 
to saying, well, look, um, six years is the maximum or eight years, whatever, is the maximum that HMRC, HMRC should be able to go back because on the loan charge, they're going back 20 years. Yeah. I, I just think that HMRC need to consider people's individual circumstances. And I know that a lot of people, you know, feel that they've been put through hell by the way they've been treated. Uh, and I just don't think it needs to be like that. You know, the people we really need to be going out after are the, you know, the, the, the big corporates and the, uh, the, the very wealthy individuals who, you know, use all sorts of clever schemes to get p out of paying their fair share okay. of tax. I don't think that the HMRC should be taking such a bulldozer to, to people's family finances. Right, let's go to Alex in Newcastle. Hi, Alex. Hi, thank you both for having me on. Um, yes, I, I'm Alex. I'm a I'm climate scientist, PhD student, and I wanted to ask, considering that by 2050, that's less than 30 years' time, Food production is going to decrease by half because of the climate crisis, while food demand is going to increase by 60%, meaning every single person on average will have half as much food to eat. Do you not think backpedaling on Labour's green pledges, which you're currently trying to do as a party, is just a betrayal of all the working class people who are already struggling to afford food? It's a betrayal of the young people who are just trying to make a living in the, in the world, which is going to be increasingly more difficult. And it's most importantly a betrayal of all the people in the Global South countries that are struggling to feed themselves okay. currently because of famine and drought. Rachel. Well, Alex, we've got a really ambitious uh, green prosperity plan to invest in the industries of the uh, future alongside business uh, through our National Wealth Fund and also through the creation of GB Energy, a wholly publicly owned uh, energy company to invest in, in big projects. And, you know, this is all about uh, boosting our energy security so we're less reliant on Putin and dictators around the world um, so that we can get our bills down because bills are, despite the, the falls earlier this week, are twice as high as what they were a year ago. And also to bring to Britain the jobs for our young people uh, for the future, whether that's in a carbon capture and storage, green hydrogen, floating offshore wind. You know, some country in the world is going to be leading in these industries of the future. There's every reason to think it can be Britain. We've got the entrepreneurs, we've got the industrial heritage, we've got the geography and the climate. We just need a government that's going to back these. But yeah, I've but, always been... But, Really you've clear. reneged on your, as well, Alex look, says, you've reneged on this 28 billion green energy pledge. Well, look, when I first announced our green prosperity plan two years ago, um, interest rates were a, a fraction of where they are today. And as was inflation, we've had 13 increases in interest rates since then. And I've always been really clear, and you know this, Ian, that we've got a set of fiscal rules that an incoming Labour government would abide to because any plan for growth and prosperity has got to be built on a rock of economic, financial and fiscal stability and we saw what happens when you play fast and loose with the public finances that's what Liz Truss and Quasi Quarting did and we're now all paying the price so we've said that we would phase in our green prosperity plan over the course of the next uh, parliament that is the right and responsible thing to do but I'm absolutely committed to the things that are needed to do to meet our climate obligations but more importantly actually for most people listening to reduce people's energy bills uh, to get the jobs for Britain and to secure our energy but supply you, so we're less reliant on dictators. You've got a real opportunity to differentiate yourself from the government here and uh, there's a story that's just been published uh, by The Guardian in the last few minutes which uh, they say the government is drawing up plans to drop the UK's flagship £11.6 billion climate funding pledge uh, as the Prime Minister is accused of betraying populations most vulnerable the, 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 of betraying populations most vulnerable to global heating. Now again that links to what Alex is saying there. Surely this is something where you can really say, well, look, people say there's no difference between the political parties. Well, here is a policy where there is a difference. Well, our Green Prosperity Plan is a massive dividing line with the government. You know, I've, I'm not sure if I've ever heard Rishi Sunak talk about uh, jobs in the low-carbon industries of the future or the need to address the climate emergency. He's just not interested in these uh, issues. And, you know, a year and a half ago, we hosted the COP26 conference um, in Glasgow. Uh, Last year, the Prime Minister had to be dragged, kicking and screaming, to the follow-up conference in uh, Egypt. It's not a priority for him, but it is a priority for me, because I see this as a way to boost our energy security, reduce people's bills, 
get the jobs and wealth and prosperity back here in Britain and, as Alex rightly says, to meet our obligations uh, to tackle the climate emergency. Um, Alex, quick response from you. I mean, it's always the same sort of things. We need to talk about economic growth, even though it's ridiculous to have um, infinite growth on, with finite resources. It's talking about all of these things of carbon capture, which just inherently does not work. I don't even want to get into that. I don't think you understand what I'm saying, Rachel. People will have half as much food to eat. When people are struggling for food, that creates wars, that creates tension. We're talking about societal collapse in less than 30 years' time, unless we really make these climate targets. Okay. So I don't want to hear about, like, new jobs and stuff. I want to actually get on and do it. And well, do I think people in the jobs. global south and people who are struggling do want to hear about jobs paying decent wages. They do want to I hear about to reducing energy bills. Uh, yeah, and there's some really great innovation happening. I was at a place in uh, Liverpool recently uh, where they are growing in the city centre um, uh, food produce uh, indoors using new technologies uh, and, uh, and, and, and a much greater uh, efficiency. So there's massive innovation going on. And what I'm saying is, you know, we're great innovators. We're great entrepreneurs in Britain. Let's attract that investment okay. and those jobs here because other countries are stealing a march on us. I want Britain to be a global leader, but that will only happen if you've got a government that takes this seriously and a Labour government will. More of your calls in just a few moments' time. It's 7.33 News Headlines with Lottie Morley. The Metropolitan Police is reopening an investigation into claims of COVID rule-breaking at the headquarters of the Conservative Party in December 2020. A separate new investigation will focus on a gathering in Parliament in the same month. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves has told LBC supermarkets need to do more to ensure money saving is passed on to customers. Retailers have been accused of profiteering from higher prices and not introducing reductions to shelves quickly enough. And a man has been found guilty of murdering a mother and her two daughters after pouring petrol through a letterbox and setting a flat on fire in Nottingham. 31-year-old Jamie Barrow claimed he didn't know they were home at the time last November. LBC weather, showers will linger for some this evening but turning drier for most, reaching lows of six degrees in Scotland. This is LBC.
Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Alexa, send a comment to LBC. Uh, 7.37. Rachel is here for the next eight minutes. So I'm going to try and get three questions in eight minutes. So uh, short questions, short answers, please. Fiona is in Hampstead. Hello, Fiona. Hello, Ian, and hi, Rachel. Hi, Fiona. Uh, my background is I'm a pensioner, late 60s, living alone through hard work and not having any kids. I've amassed a property portfolio investments worth £2.5 million. I will need my money for care when I'm older, of course. So... I cannot vote for Labour unless they confirm there will be no wealth tax. Will Rachel confirm no wealth tax? Well, you wanted short answers, (laughs) and I can give you one. I can confirm there will be no wealth tax. Excellent. Thank you. Nice to talk to you, Fiona. Well, that was a a very easily one. But what about the top rate of tax? Because there's a bit of confusion on that, isn't there? No, I don't think so. We've got no plans to raise the top rate of income tax. No plans is the same. We never will. Well, look, I, I don't think you can say you'll never do anything, but we're certainly not going to, um, you know, put in our manifesto or anything like that um, it plans to increase the top rate of income tax. You know, the problem today is that the tax burden is at a 70-year high. The real challenge in our economy is getting growth, which is why things like our reform to business rates, our reforms to the apprenticeship levy, our green prosperity plan, our reforms to the botched Brexit deal, they are absolutely crucial because those are the things that are needed to grow our economy improve people's standard of living and then have the money that we need for our public services and that's why you'll hear Kira and me speaking so much about the the need to bring jobs growth and prosperity to Britain what, what, there's loads of potential here we need a government that's going to work okay. with businesses but, to realize it but when he stood for the leadership of the Labour Party he said uh, I want to increase income tax for the top five percent of earners now three years on from that he says, um, my principle is to lower taxes. I'm not looking to the level of taxation. I, I mean, those two things don't match up. How can you change your view in such a short time? Well, if you look at all the changes that have happened in the last three years in the UK um, and the position we are in now when growth is on the floor, inflation is through the roof, as our interest uh, rates and our tax burden is at a 70-year high, the answer can't just be uh, higher taxes on working people. It's got to be thinking of ways to grow the economy, to improve living standards and the size of the pie that we can then better share out. But the challenge at the moment is getting that growth because under the last Labour government, our economy grew on average by 2% a year. Under the Tories, it's been 1.4% a year. We've got to grow the economy and create that wealth and prosperity right across the UK. Right, next question from Rocky in Islington. Hi, Rocky. Hi, Ian. Hi, Rachel. You're Hello. Right. Very good. How are you? <laughs> um, yeah, good, thank you. So, like your former caller earlier, uh, Manny, I'm also a young um, former, I say former now, Conservative voter, because I don't think they represent me anymore. <laughs> um, I just wonder what Labour's stance was on uh, nationalisation with regards to water now, especially with what's been going on with Thames Water and whatnot recently. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. In the leadership contest, Keir Starmer did commit to nationalising water, but I gather, again, that's another U-turn. So, Kira and me are pretty pragmatic on um, ownership. If you take railways, for example, when they come up, their contracts come up, we'll bring those back in-house because we think that's better value for money for taxpayers. But if you look at a company like Thames Water that has fleeced that company, has taken billions of pounds out of it and has not invested fully, um, I don't see why taxpayers now should step in and pick up the pieces. What we need to do is ensure that Thames Water and other water companies sort out the problems that they've created, make the investments to stop sewage leaking into our seas and our rivers. But I I feel that, you know, Thames Water would love it if the taxpayer came in and said, right, you've created all these problems, we're now going to pay to fix them. Through tough regulation, we've got to make sure that these water companies uh, pay the price for fixing the sewage that is leaking into our rivers and seas. And we would do that by much tougher fines for company bosses, by proper monitoring of uh, outflows of uh, uh, sewage, and, uh, and, and making sure that company bosses take responsibility for what is happening, and toughening up the regulator so that companies like Thames Water can't take billions of pounds out of the company and pay it in dividends when they are leaking money so, so and leaking why, water every day. Why, when he was running for Labour leader, did he name-check rail, mail, energy and water to bring into what he called common ownership? And 
yet he's gone back on that. Doesn't this show that Keir Starmer says one thing to get power and then when he gets power, he adopts a completely different policy? Well, look, Keir Starmer wants to win the next general election and we are going to face, well, we face, if we win the next election, the toughest economic inheritance of any government. It would cost tens of billions of pounds to bring all these companies into public ownership. When you've got the NHS on its knees, when you've got uh, living standards deteriorating like they're doing today, when you've got class sizes for our kids uh, increasing, uh, I just think you've got to decide what your priorities uh, are in the circumstances that you inherit. And on water, you know, obviously the system is not working today, but it's got to be the water companies now that pay to sort out the mess that they've okay. created. Uh, a text question from somebody who hasn't left a name. As a teacher at the girls' school you attended... Oh, that's, that's Kater Rachel, Park. Not yep. me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to know if there's uh, money in a Labour budget to value teachers in the public sector with a pay amount in line with the independent review body recommendations, as Gillian Keegan and Rishi Sunak stated, and then you turned on. Um, now, we should, of course, remind you that Labour announced a two thousand four hundred pound welcome bonus for new teachers yesterday but did not commit to the 6.5 percent pay rise which teachers are asking for well it's great to hear from a, a teacher at my old secondary school in uh, a penge in southeast london um and uh, I was really lucky at, at my school. I had fantastic teachers, but it was against the odds. You know, I went to school in the 80s and 90s. When I was at Cater Park, the sixth form was a couple of prefab huts in the playground. Our library was turned into a classroom because there was more children than there were space. And there were never enough textbooks to go around. So we had to share and one did your French homework on Monday and then the other person did it on Tuesday. It wasn't good enough. Now, we had great teachers and they made a massive impact on my life, but they were working against the uh, odds. Well, now, you did a very good job, if I may say oh, so. Oh, thank you, Ian. <laughs> thank you. It's not the first nice thing now, you've now, said now, to me, now, but what, I was a what, bit what shocked. About, what about but the But the, the point that, the, the, um, that my, um, the teacher in my former school is making, um, look, Bridget Phillipson has already said this week that we recognise that particularly newly qualified uh, teachers often struggle financially and has announced this new teacher uh, bonus. We've also said that under a Labour government, there would be VAT on private school fees and that money would go directly into our state schools where it's desperately uh, well, needed. It, it would have to be to fund all of the pupils that would be coming out of private schools to go to state schools, well, but apparently Bridget Phillipson doesn't think there'll be any extra, there'll be any outflow from the private well, if sector. Well, if you look at what Labour did in 1997 when we got rid of the assisted places schemes... Uh, the private schools all said, right, scholarships will end. Well, they didn't end. The schools found a way to pay for those scholarships and uh, the money was then used to reduce class sizes for five, six and seven-year-olds. And I'm convinced that if the private schools want to keep talented kids at their school, they'll find a way to help them with um, an increase in uh, fees. But look, I am all about aspiration and I want kids from whatever background they come from to get the best possible start in life. That means investing in teachers, it means investing in our schools and by switching some of that resource from a tax break for people sending their kids to private school to our state schools, I think that is a better use of public money and it's something that I'm determined to do as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Well, as Betty Boothroyd would say, time's up. Thank you very much indeed. We'll see you again. Are we, see, are we seeing Rachel in August? Probably not, but we will well, do in September. It's great to be here with you again, Ian, and well, thanks, great to have you back thanks, in the chair. Thanks for coming in. Now, just a reminder, cross question at eight, we have uh, Rachel's Labour colleague, Alison McGovern, joining us. She's their Shadow em Employment Spokeswoman. Paul Holmes, Vice Chairman of the Conservative Party. Alexander Downer, the former Australian Foreign Minister. Lots of, lots of cricket jokes to be had at his expense, or maybe he'll have them at our expense. I don't know. And Yasmin Ahmed, who is a human rights uh, specialist. They'll be here to answer your questions after a... I do, I do want a cricket question, by the way. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. It's 746.